Hi, I'm Lily. Today I'm going to show you how to create a formal dining room by hand and from scratch. I'm going to use this miniature set on my next animation that I'm going to upload very, very soon. So if you want to see it coming to life, keep an eye on my channel. In this tutorial today, I'm going to show you how I build everything and all the processes and techniques that I've used to create the flooring, all the piece of furniture, the wood paneling, the sculpted ceiling and the lighting. I hope you enjoy this video. So first I like to work with mock-ups. So I take a piece of paper to get an idea of the proportion of the room, of the layout. I also cut some pieces for my furniture to get an idea of how they're going to work within the space. I start to think about my windows and how the light is going to get into the room and also where the door is going to be. Then I've cut some piece of plywood to create the base of my platform and also for the walls. I've also cut some pieces of studs for underneath the platform. So I use my plywood. This time it happened to be 18 millimeter thick, but you can use 12 mm. that's going to work as well. And I place them on top of studs, line them up on the edges and use a nail gun to attach them together. All my platforms are raised because it's for stop motion animation. So I need space underneath to access the screws underneath each feet of the puppets. Then I use other piece of plywood that I've cut to create the walls. I drill into the studs and attach the walls to it and I keep building it up, adding more walls. The fact that every wall are attached with the screw to the stud means I can remove them at any time and they are completely modular. I've also cut the fourth wall because I wanted to make sure I can shoot my animation from every single direction I want. Then I mark up a line to know exactly the level of the floor and also where the walls touch each other. Then I start to work on the back wall, which have the window opening. I mark them up with a pencil and then I use a jigsaw to cut them out. Now I reassemble my pieces together and you might notice I've added another piece of stud at the front because I knew that my fourth wall needed a bit more support so I can drill my wall into the stud. And also I've cut out an opening that is wider because I wanted to have access underneath. I knew my main character would be in that position so I need to have a clear access underneath the screws for that special puppet. I've got another piece of plywood for the ceiling. I knew I needed to create a corridor because the main door of the dining room will be open so you need something behind it. So for that I've cut more plywood and studs and assembled them and created a box to fit next to my dining room. And I've also cut out some door opening on each side of that little corridor. Now let's tackle the sculpted ceiling. I spent quite some time uh, sketching and try to get an idea of what design I wanted to do with my ceiling because you can go in so many different directions with it. So it's worth taking your time to think about what effects you want to create, how complex or intricate you want your details to be. Then after spending quite some time doing my sketches, I found one that I thought was the most fitted for that specific room. Then I went over it with some marker pen. It doesn't matter what colors you have, it's just about making them clear, uh, especially if you have a design like mine, when you have line that goes on top of each other or underneath, you need to have some colors that are just easy to follow. So it makes sense of which line goes where. Then I took one of my favorite material, Wobla. It's a brilliant thermoplastic and I cut some slice into it. The first strips were probably seven or eight mil wide. And then I cut some thinner strip, maybe two, three mil. And then I warm them up with a heat gun. And when they are hot, they will bond to each other naturally. So I create little trims like that. And then I start prepping my table. First, I lay an oven mat to protect the table from the heat. Then I place my sketch on top of it, hold it in with duct tape. And then I lay some baking paper and attach it as well with duct tape. Then I took my heat gun and the trim of Wobla, warmed them up and very patiently I went over every single line and tried to follow the shape. The most complicated part was when I had two trim that need to bond to each other so I needed my sculpting tool and make sure they were both heated to blend them into one another. This part was really tricky and I needed lots of patience to manage it. Once you get used to it, it gets a bit better so I just follow up, make sure the Wobla is still lined up with my sketch underneath and just keep hitting up make sure I follow the trim when it goes under the other one or above it so the whole thing is cohesive 
and then I waited until it was completely cool and then slide it because I was too lazy to make the whole sketch for the whole surface. So I needed to slide it on the side and then I can reuse the templates underneath to continue building it up. And I repeat the same process again and again. And then wait until it was completely cold, slide it and continue until the end of it. Then I let it completely cool down and then I can remove it. I position it onto a bigger cutting mat so that I can have some clear line and check if it was actually correctly lined up. Also to mark how much I need to trim out. Because Wobla is quite soft, you can use some scissors that will do the job. And then even though the sculpture was kind of flat, it wasn't flat enough for me. So I tried to use the heat gun to reheat the whole thing a bit longer than before and to make sure that the Wobla was melting further down. And then I completely, completely let it cool down before I even do anything with it. Otherwise, you're going to stretch and distort it. Then I apply some PVA on my plywood, position my Wobla sculpture in the center of it reuse my baking paper above it and then use some heavy boards and heavy books and let it dry overnight. The next day I've noticed there were still some little gaps here and there so I used my favorite 3D paints, Paper Sand Relief, to fill them up and some wet Q-tips which were good to remove the excess and I have a nice finish. And if you wonder, yes, it took forever to do this but it was essential to make sure that the ceiling will look beautiful by the time I finish and paint it. Now let's go back to the wall of that room. I made a detailed sketch which showed the window opening but also all the paneling and then I had my piece of plywood with the windows cut out. I took some basil wood and cut some trim to cover all the edges of the plywood Then I use a marking gauge, which is such a brilliant carpentry tool. You get your measurement on it, and then you can report that measurement on every single piece of basil to make sure that all of them are the right size. Cut them out. And then I use a sanding pad or soft sponge, which is great just to finish all the pieces off before I glue them down. It's super soft sanding paper, but that's all it needs for basil wood, and I use this absolutely all the time. And then I start to create some trim for all around the edges of my windows. I like to use a tiny mitre box that you will find in the tiling section of your DIY store. It's good to have a clean line at the right angle. I mean, you can eyeball it, but you only go so far when you eyeball things. With this, you have a much cleaner and nicer cut. Then I've copied all the detail of the paneling onto my plywood with a pencil. I've cut some skirting out of 3mm thick basil wood and use my sculpting tool, but you can also use some screwdriver for example, to mark some line into it. And because basil wood is so soft, it will mark very easily. And that's a very simple way to create some detail. And my advice will be to go deeper than what you think because otherwise the paint is going to fill it up so your details will be gone. And then I just build a whole paneling with more pieces of basil wood, take my time to cut them to size and then super glue them in position. And you might notice at the top of the wall, I've also added a trim. It's a nice way to finish it off. And I made the same thing for every single wall. When you come to the wall, which have a fireplace, I've reused an old bit of timber, glue it in place, and then I can do all my paneling on top of it, as well as a little fireplace with basil wood as well. Now let's tackle the chevron flooring. First, I edge some wood using some thin layer of basil wood and some sculpting tool. You can use a screwdriver that will do as well, just to carve some curve into the wood and edge it. Then I cut it into plank, one centimeter wide. Then I sand down the edges on each side. Then I took some card that was big enough to cover the whole surface of the floor. I knew that half of my floorboard would go in one direction and the other half in the other direction. Now when it comes to my basil wood, they were not long enough to cover the whole half. So I had to cut the card to make sure that the basil wood would be long enough to cover that length. Then I marked some line with a permanent marker at 90 degree angle for reference. Apply some PVA, mine is clear but any PVA will do. And then I glue on my floorboard on top of it, make sure I stay within those clear reference lines. I've covered the whole surface and then I've applied some heavy books and let it dry overnight. 
The next day I had a nice board to work with and I can follow the edge of the cardboard to trim all the extra of balsa wood. Then I can go back to the cardboard side and write up some measurements so I can cut this into different sections. And I went over it quite a few times with a standing knife to go through all the different layers. And there you go, I have one bit. I've used a little bit of a sanding pad just to make sure I have nice smooth edges. Then I can start laying out all my pieces, make sure they were a nice fit. Then I apply some PVA, position them back in, and then I apply some heavy book and once again leave it dry for at least a few hours, ideally overnight. The next day, I can trim the edges, sand them down, and then I have a nice floor. Then I start reassembling all my walls, realizing by the time the walls were back in, there was still a little bit of gap on each side, so I took some small trim of basil wood just to cover the edges. It gave a cleaner finish. I realized I needed earth underneath the fireplace, so I slide a piece of paper underneath the fireplace to create a paper template, cut it out, copy onto a piece of thin basil wood, make sure it was a nice fit, and then painting it with two coats of acrylic paint. Now let's go back to those big windows. First I need a template, so I slide a piece of card underneath and went all around it with a pencil. Then I cut it out. And I start marking up the design for the windows. Once I was happy with the pencil version, I went over it with a pen, so it's easier to see. Then I start cutting up some basil wood 3mm thick to create all the timber parts of that window. I've applied a baking paper on top of my template and super glue my basil wood to each other using a super glue with an activator like Matterborn that will help. That's my main structure done. And I use some nail file to just smooth the edges and make sure everything looks nice. Then I position my wall back onto the baking paper, apply some super glue all along, slide my window into it, and then I've cut some really thin piece of trim and go all along the windows to make sure I have a nice cleaner edge. And obviously I copy the same for both windows. Now for the glass panel, I've used some clear plastic, remove the protective layer, position it on top of my template, tape it in place and then use some 3D paint. My favorite is Pebble Sand Relief and go over every line that will compose the grill of the window and let it set for at least a few hours, ideally overnight. So now while that was drying, I went back to my ceiling. I knew my ceiling would be moderate, so it need to be a perfect fit and slide into the wall exactly. So to do that, I need to have a clean line as reference. So I positioned my ceiling onto my room and then I use some little metal brackets and attach it all along so I know that it's firmly attached to the wall. Then I can remove the front wall and get access into the room and with a pencil I mark a line where the wall will touch the ceiling exactly. Now once I have my reference line, especially around the fireplace, I can see that my wall black piece was completely off. So I had to do a little bit of adjustments. So I used my stainer knife, lift it up, and then I had to heat and stretch the wall black to get back into where it's supposed to be so that both sides around the chimney breast are symmetrical. Then I took some ceiling rows that I did for my previous project. If you look at my tutorial for the set with the grand staircase, I show in detail how I made them from scratch and I had some leftovers, so I thought I'm gonna use it for this room as well. I super glue it in the center of my ceiling and then I start to work on the crown molding all around it. First, I took a little button of basa wood and I start to trim precisely the warbler all along the edges. Once the trim was done, I can super glue those buttons in place. I went along the chimney breast as well. I took my time to make sure it was a nice fit. And once they were super glue, I used my 3D paint, Pebble Sand Relief, to fill all the little gap and use some Q-tips that were wet to help remove all the excess. And then I start to build up the crown molding. So I use some more black, three millimeter thick and start to go upwards, so 90 degree angle from the base. And I took my time to make sure this was right and lined up to my reference line underneath, otherwise it's not gonna slide into the wall correctly. And I start to building up the inside of it using more piece of basa wood, 
thinner strips and fill the center as well. It's probably best if you have a triangle of basil wood. I didn't have it, so I've done with whatever I can grab. I have add another stick of timber. And then I use my paper sand relief as a filler to fill the little gap here and there and make sure I remove all the excess with the wet Q-tips. Then I can apply some gesso to prime it and two coat of acrylic paint. While that was drying, I start focusing on the corridor. For that, I have my base, but it was lower than the rest of the floor. So I decide to use some foam board just to raise the level of the floor. So it lined up with the other room. Cut some piece of basil wood to create my floorboards. Apply some PVA. Apply the floorboards. Add some paper and some heavy books and let them dry overnight. Then I can trim the edges, send them down and make sure that new floor was really nicely lined up with the other floor of the dining room. Then I can add my walls on either side and more importantly, lined up exactly where the floor is. That means I can start working on the paneling on the other side of that wall. Once I have the main measurement, which is the floor level, I can start adding the skirting and adding more of the paneling. For that wall, I decided to do something that is simpler and also lower than the rest of the room. I wanted some contrast compared to the other dining room. At the end of it, most of the structure was done and I can start focusing on the painting. First, I primed the whole thing with white gesso, then apply two coats of acrylic paint, Protect the paint with a clear matte sealer and then I start to do the washes. Apply some dark diluted acrylic paints and remove the excess with a wet paper towel. And finally I protect it with a clear matte varnish. I've done the same thing for the floor. Apply two coats of acrylic paint, same thing for the floor of the corridor. Protect with a clear matte sealer. Start to apply my washes with diluted brown paint. Remove all the excess with wet paper towel. I've done some dry brushing as well, using a white brush and some lighter color to have all the highlights showing up and protect it with a clear matte varnish. Now when it comes to the corridor, I had to deal with a similar situation than the dining room when it comes to the ceiling. So I position my ceiling with the little metal bracket all along, mark up some reference lines so I know exactly where they need to line up. And then I just turned the whole thing upside down. It was easier to access from the door opening on each side and mark up exactly where the walls are touching the ceiling. So I have my line to follow. And then I've used some other extra ceiling roses, drill into them, super glue them to the ceiling, and then drill into the plywood. I've also built up some crown molding all around for that room and make sure they're lined up with the reference line that I've just marked earlier. Now we come to the rest of the corridor. There is some paneling on every wall. There is the door opening with a bit of trim. The door themselves, I build them up with some piece of card where I mark up all the paneling. And then I've used some basil wood and cut them to size so I create all the paneling on that door. I left an opening on the top of the door because I wanted to have a glass panel later on. And this is what they look like when they're all done and painted. Now let's return to the main dining room. Now that all my walls were painted, I can position my glass panel into the window. For that, I turn my board around, position my pieces of clear plastic with the 3D paint that it was completely dry, use a tiny bit of super glue all along and press my clear glass onto it. Done the same for both. I've reattached all my walls. I've also super glued my little black earth against the fireplace. And I'm going to talk about the wallpaper. Basically, you can buy any dollhouse wallpaper you want, but I thought I might as well do it myself. So I found some patterns online that I thought was interesting. I cleaned them up on Photoshop, removed the background, and then I wanted some red wallpaper. I didn't want to spend a fortune in ink cartridges, so I've just used some red card and then printed it with a black ink only. That way I have some red wallpaper that doesn't cost me a fortune. I just cut them to size, make sure there's a continuity with the pattern and use some spray tack to attach them to the plywood. 
that made quite an impact. And then the moment of truth, I finally slide the ceiling and he was sliding back into the wall. Oh, I felt relief at that time. That was good. Now to finish that room, I needed to add the door. So for that, I took a piece of card, some tiny little hinges and marked the paneling on the card. Then I've cut some piece of balsa wood, super glue them to the card and then I prime, paint and age the door to fit with everything else. For the door handle, I've used some flat wire first cut it into section of 25 mil, use some metal file to smooth the edges. I use some round wire and cut it into little tubes, maybe five or six mil long, and same, sand the edges down with metal file. Then I use some jewelry plier and curve the flat wire nicely so that it go all along my little tube of round wire. And then I kept bending the flat wire so I have a nice overall shape and curve to it. Then I can add a little bit of super glue and attach the tube into the handle. And then I'll add more super glue and attach it to a tiny eyelet for the base of my handle. If you have one of those super glue with an activator like Matterbone, that will help significantly for this kind of task. And there you have it. Now in order to paint them, I use some leftover of foam board and use a tiny little bit of super glue to hold them in position so that I can prime it and then use a bronze acrylic paint on it. Now I'm going to tackle the curtains. First I made a sketch on the right scale showing the design and size of my curtain and I've decided to go for a piece at the top of the curtain. Permit? Permit? I'm not sure how it's pronounced but anyway. I had this leftover fabric from a previous project which have this kind of dated look and quite heavy fabric and I thought that was quite suitable. Then I built up the little box with some Baza wooden super glue. The main top part will be connected directly to the wall and the rest will be useful to hide the top of the curtain inside of it. So I cover this little box with the fabric and some super glue. If it's not the prettiest job behind it, don't worry, you're not going to see it anyway. Then I took my sewing machine out and start assembling my curtains. I made four of them, sew it around three of the edges. Then inside of it, I always insert the magical ingredients to make the curtain work for me. It's your aluminium mesh. That means I can sculpt the curtains once it's in it. And I use this for every single curtains on all my miniature sets. Because I was working with thick fabric, I thought I might as well double the aluminium mesh and I'm glad I did. So I inserted inside of my little pockets, made sure it went all the way to the bottom and the edges. And once it was in it, I can sculpt it. Then I close up the top of the curtain and start shaping all my curve. And basically you can choose how many folds you want, how exactly you want them to, to have a nice curve because that's the beauty of aluminium mesh. You really sculpt the fabric once it's in it and it stay there. Then I assemble my curtains and the permit above it, start to shape the curve on each side. And then I knew I wanted to add some tie back. So first I took some thread and a needle and just attach it a bit tighter so that will stay in place. I position everything onto my wall, took my time with that, and then use some super glue to first attach the permits and then use more super glue on each side of the frame to attach the curtain to it. I've done this for both set of curtains. And then for the tie back, I've used some leftover fabric that I stitched together, super glue it to the main curtain. And for the tie back itself, I just use some black wire and some jewelry plier to shape it and a little bit of super glue to then attach it to the wall and to the curtain. And those kind of little details are really important. They make a whole difference. It's like other things that I've added to the room, like switches and sockets. Those are really important details as well. I've used some PLA plate, but any kind of plastic will do. And you just cut them to size, super glue to a board, prime it with white gesso, paint it and age it. I've also printed some tile insert for the fireplace to the right scale and super glue them to each side of the fireplace. Now I'm going to talk about the lights, starting with the wall lights. To create those, I super glue a bunch of components. So first I use a tiny bit of a metal eyelet, then I super glue a medium bead, then I use a bit of thin wire, then super glue a small bead, and then I had a bunch of those plastic cover that I had from a fitting kitchen years ago. And basically they are used to hide the screws, but they have this plastic component that are just at the right size, so I thought that's perfect. To attach them together, I've used some super glue and I've used one with an activator such might have bond. Then I use a tiny bit of super glue to attach them to some leftover foam board so I can prime them with white gesso, paint them with two coats of acrylic paint in gold and then age them so that they look realistic. 
For the glass part of the lighting, I've used some clear wool black, warm it up, and wrapped it around a piece of wooden dowel. The wool black didn't cover the whole surface, and that was on purpose. There was an opening at the back because I needed this opening to bring the LEDs from behind the wall into the light fitting. Then I can assemble my part, use the clear wool black part when it's completely cooled down, dip it into some super glue, and slide it onto my base. Then a tiny bit of super glue to attach the top part and I think it looks pretty cool. Now when it comes to the light source itself, I always use those micro LEDs on every single set. You can find them super cheap on eBay and Amazon. You can have them with a remote if you can find some. Honestly, that's gonna make your life much easier. And because all my sets are completely modular, I need one set for each wall or each ceiling because they're gonna be able to be separated. So that's why I have five sets of micro LEDs for my miniature set. First, I position my wall light and decide where I need my LEDs to come from. Then I use the drill to drill into the ply, group a bunch of LEDs, probably 10 or 15 of them, and pass them through the wall. Then I position my light fitting onto it so the LEDs come through the glass at the opening of the clear wall at the back. And then I use some super glue to attach every single one of them. And honestly, it was so fiddly. I remember there was lots of swearing involved just to get this lighting on the wall. It was, it was tricky, but while I was at it with the super glue, I've also decided to attach the switches and the sockets onto my walls and then it started to look like something so I was happy with it. So now as you can see the LEDs I've got one set on one wall and I use some duct tape to make sure they are hold in place. Another set on the back and make sure there was no micro LEDs that passed behind so I pass all the LEDs wire above it and the third set of LEDs onto the third wall. Now we come to the ceiling light I drill a big hole in the center of my ceiling I knew I was about to play with some super glue and the last thing I want is to mess up my ceiling. So I use a big sheet of paper to cover it and protect the ceiling. Then I use a tiny eyelet or washer and super glue it to the center of my ceiling rows because I needed to make absolutely sure I have a stable flat base. Then I warm up a piece of white wool block and wrapped it around a piece of wooden dowel and let it cool down completely. I made a template in card to define the shape of my lighting and I copied this card template onto a piece of PLA plate. I think it was one millimeter thick. Then I super glued the tube of white wool black once it was completely cooled down to my little base. Then I super glued the PLA oval plates on top of it, make sure everything was lined up. And use the cardboard template to shape some flat wire, five millimeter thick, all around it. Cut it to size and then I've done it twice and I super glued the edges together. And then I start to patiently assemble some beads onto a piece of wire, medium one and small one, long enough to go all around the oval twice. And then I super glue patiently the wire and bead threads all around my flat wire. And that was honestly, that was a fight with the super glue to get it done. Then I reuse my template, some more flat wire, but this time instead of going around my template, I went above it and that will create the base inside of my light. Then I can position the flat wire that got the beads on it onto this part and super glue it together. Because aluminium wire is so soft, you can just use some nail file if you want to polish and smooth the edges. Then I've added more flat wire on each corner of my shape and attach it with super glue so then I can connect it the top parts to it. And this is what it looked like before I start priming it with white gesso and apply two coats of acrylic paint in gold. Then I went back to my ceiling, used 10 meter of micro LEDs, passed it from underneath, then I wrapped up around my fingers to create the same kind of oval than the shape of the light itself and use a tiny bit of super glue to make sure it stay there. Now it's a piece of plastic that will be opaque so you cannot see the LEDs directly. So I had some transparent plastic and I realized usually they come with this kind of protective layers on top of it and one of them look opaque. So actually I, I had some clear plastic available. If I didn't remove that, that means I have an opaque plastic, which is exactly what I wanted. So I kept the protective layer on it, positioned it inside of my light, add another piece of it all along the edges and then once it was in the right position, I use a tiny bit of super glue to make sure it stay there. And then I can super glue it to my base. Once it was all done, I can remove my paper template, position it back into my set and appreciate the results. 
Now when it comes to the light fitting in the corridor, I follow similar techniques. So I've used the same flat wire and the PLA plate. I've shaped my flat wire so it can be a nice curve. I've cut some disc of PLA and made a big hole in the middle of it. Now for the glass of this light shade, I warm up a piece of clear wobbler and use a nail polish remover that just got the perfect shape cap. And so I can stretch my clear wobbler onto it and let it completely cool down. So I have a really nice, interesting shape out of something that I just find in my workshop. Then I took my micro LEDs and went from above the ceiling, group another probably dozen of LEDs through it, add some tube of white warbler once they were completely cooled down to hide all the wire. Then I pass my disc of PLA onto it. For the glass, I wanted them to be some kind of opaque as well, but it didn't have the protective layer of the normal plastic. This was warbler. So instead I've used some white paint and just dab it and it actually did the job. So it works. Once all those lights were done, I focus on everything else. So all the detail of that room, for example, making frames out of basswood wood and super glue as well. And then you prime them, you paint them, you age them, and then you can super glue some landscape or, or painting into them. When it comes to position them onto my set, I like to use black tack or white tack, just so that I can change the position if I'm not happy with it. They're not permanently set there. So now I'm gonna tackle the furniture. First, I made a little sketch for my chair. So I made this sketch to have precise dimension to work with and also to have the kind of curve I wanted to create. Then I took some tracing paper and went over it with a permanent marker to define the curve that I wanted to achieve and the last part for the front leg. I've got the tracing paper and then copy this shape onto a piece of basil wood, five millimeter thick. So I had one for the back, for the angle and one for the front leg. Then I took some basil wood, really thin, so that it can be curved, and I super glue it to the main shape for the curve of the back leg. And then I start to play with my favorite material, Wobla. I warm it up, then I roll it onto the oven mat so it's not gonna stick to my Wobla and it's gonna protect the table a tiny little bit. I roll it up with my finger. I think it's always useful if you have a metal ruler so you can compress the Wobla, you can help sculpting the Wobla as well. And then I wrap my Wobla all around the shape for the back of my seat. As you can see, using some sculpting tools to help shape all the edges. Initially I was cutting all the excess with the stain knife but I've learned very quickly that it's best to let it completely cool down and then you cut it. You have a much nicer clean cut if you do it that way. Then I can take my initial shape, remove it from my first template, move it to the second template which have a nice curve for shaping those legs and then I can place it there, make sure it follow the edges and the top line with a permanent marker and let it completely cool down on this mold. While that was cooling down I started to work on the legs, doing exactly the same thing, warm up some more blah, roll it up and then position it onto my leg. And as you can see there, I've used the permanent marker to just mark it and I didn't cut it. I waited until it was completely cooled down to cut it. Then I start to assemble my pieces using some tiny bit of three millimeter basil wood and super glue them in between. I've used more pieces of basil wood to connect all parts and make sure they're sturdy together. I've created a little base for my seat with more basil wood and some tiny little trim on the edges as well. Then I start tackling the table. I've made a paper template in a nice oval shape, copy it onto a piece of five millimeter thick basil wood, cut it out with my Japanese saw and send it down. Then for the legs of my table, I decided I had this really nice template to create the curve for the leg of my chair. Might as well reuse it. So I just cut it to size and then went back to Wobla, warm it up and roll it and position it onto this template and let it completely cool down so it will take the curve. Then I can assemble some piece of basil wood, five millimeter thick and super glue those curved legs to it. And I think it looks quite nice. Then I can prime it with white gesso, apply two coats of acrylic paint, and I've also applied some gloss varnish to give this kind of shine that you see on old furniture. Then when we come to the cushion, I've done some template in card, copy them onto some EVA foam, cut all the edges with a scissor to curve them up. 
and I went back to my sewing machine and tried to assemble the tiniest cushion cover. So that was fiddly already, but the fiddliest part will come later because when it comes to attaching it, the seat cushion is manageable because you just put a bit of super glue and attach it. But the back of the chair was much harder and especially you see it from both sides. So I had to use some super glue with toothpick to make sure I have the smallest amount possible to uh, place the super glue without risking staining the fabric. So honestly, that was hard. But then I can position my furniture. As you can see, I've added a bit of lace on top of my table. I think it looks cute. Now I had this nice big room, but there was some gap there on either side of the fireplace and I thought I need to create something. So I just made a paper template in graphic paper, copied on two pieces of basswood, and then I've prime paint and varnish with a gloss varnish as well. And then I super glued some tiny button that I found at the shop, which I thought was the perfect fit to go with the rest of the room. Now the last thing I'm going to talk about is those little plates. I made them out of white warbler, cut a disc out of it, warm it up, place a tiny eyelet on top of it, and then I position it on top of my nail polish remover that just happened to have the best shape cap. And then I press it onto it and it completely cooled down. And as you can see, it gave this really nice shape. The eyelet create this inside disc shape. And once it's completely cooled down, you can cut all the edges, send it down. And then to add a little bit of glamour, I use an old sculpting tool with some white tack, press it onto my plate to pick it up. And then I can just just roll it onto some gold acrylic paints so that it will touch the edges and add this nice little detail. And I can set all the table. All the food is made with FIMO. And that is just about adding those little furniture and last details to make sure the whole room is complete. And there you go. The formal dining room is finished. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Next time I'm going to upload the animation that is going to feature this set as well as the other sets that I've recently uploaded. So if you enjoyed the tutorial and you want to see them coming to life, keep an eye on my channel. See you next time. Bye bye.